the morning of the 22nd of January proved to be a busy one. The flying column and the general officer commanding with his staff had departed before sunrise and by dawn were well on their way to the Mangeni. As already discussed in chapter one of this story, this would see number three column split into three entities, one at the camp, one at the Mangeni, and one in transit between. In what was perhaps the greatest feat surrounding the battle, the main Zulu army was able to maneuver itself, essentially undetected, into a bivouac from five to seven miles to the northeast of the British camp. This would place them within striking distance. So, with British intentions focused on the southeast and Zulu intentions focused on the northeast, the resulting disposition of forces would see those left at the British camp alone to face the main assault of the Zulu army. Before carrying on with this video, I'd like to remind the viewer that this is in fact the fourth in a series of videos regarding my trip to South Africa here on the channel. If you're interested in the background to my trip, as well as military details of the era and preliminary actions of the Islam Dwana campaign, then I'd invite you to watch those before continuing here. With Chelmsford, most of the NNC and the flying column out of the camp, dawn came on the morning of the 22nd like any other, with the routine change of pickets and vedettes. This was accomplished with but one small hiccup, but generally speaking, most of those left in camp began what they thought was going to be a routine day. While the men got on with their morning ablutions and breakfast, a lone horseman came galloping into the camp from the direction of Amatuchane. It was near half past seven in the morning when a trooper from the Natal Carboneers, who had been sent by Lieutenant Scott, commanding the vedettes from Amatuchane, reined in to make a report. About an hour beforehand, thousands of Zulus had been seen moving above the escarpment in the vicinity of the Niezi Hill. Now this would not be the only report of Zulu maneuver near the camp. Who saw the Zulus first is a bit unclear, but there are some accounts of small numbers of Zulus, perhaps scouting parties, advancing on the vedettes of the mounted contingent. Some evidence suggests the vedettes who were farther afield, on Itutsi and Niezi Hill, were advanced on and forced to retire. Other evidence puts these first contacts happening somewhat closer to the camp, on Itutsi and the Notch, and include numbers in the thousands moving above the escarpment. There were certainly sightings, apparently quite close, made by Captain Barry's NNC company on Nkweni Hill and on the Inyoni Ridge to the east. These contacts don't appear to have resulted in any degree of fighting, and rather are typical examples of the work carried out by vedettes, observation and reporting. These roles were certainly performed, and messages were immediately dispatched back to the camp in the early hours after dawn. One of the most significant yet strange sightings was made from the camp by Lieutenant John Chard, of the Royal Engineers, who was up for Morks Drift that morning. His sighting placed thousands of Zulus appearing on the Tahalini Spur, moving east to west, before his view of them was interrupted by the mountain of Islandwana. Presumably, this was the same significant Zulu body that the NNC picket had made contact with somewhat earlier. So we have scouting parties advancing on the vedettes. The sighting of thousands of Zulus in various spots behind the Inyoni Ridge, and even a strange feint of sort, with large numbers of Zulus appearing, then disappearing on the Tahalini Spur. Timings and locations are a bit muddled when we look at the morning contacts, but while large numbers of Zulus were in the vicinity of the camp and very close to the vedettes and pickets, they did not appear to be maneuvering to attack. Curiously, Many of these Zulus were subsequently observed to turn away from their axis of advance and withdraw to the north, the northeast, as well as to the west, presumably down to the Manzamiana Valley. What exactly the intentions of the Zulus were that morning is hotly debated. Amongst the theories postulated, two in particular stand out. Firstly, what was witnessed in the early hours of the 22nd 
was in fact a false start to the attack. The theory goes that the noise of the fighting at the Mengeni earlier that same morning was mistaken by some of the Zulu regiments in and around the Ingumbedi Valley as a compromise of their army. Thinking that the battle was joined, they moved quickly to the attack. As they maneuvered behind the ridge to get closer to the camp and attack it, they were stopped by frantic messages sent from the main command of the Zulu army back at the Ingobeni. They then turned and headed for the closest concealment behind the high ground to the north, northeast, and west. A second theory of note is that this significant movement of Zulu forces was in fact the deployment of the right horn of the Zulu army into more advantageous ground from which to launch their assault. Given the distances involved from the Ingumbedi and the desire to have the attack on the camp somewhat coordinated, it was necessary to move the right wing closer to the camp as it had the farthest to go when compared to the center and the left. If this was the case, then the commander of the Zulus who exposed themselves on the Talheni Spur should have been shot for dereliction of duty, but I digress. Casting its shadow over all of these observations was yet another layer of speculation, and that was more spiritual in nature. The phase of the moon occurring on the 22nd was not spiritually advantageous to joining battle. Call it the Zulu version of no fighting on Sunday. There is evidence to suggest that the Zulu command intended to attack on the 23rd, when it was seen to have been more appropriate. Now, of course, this isn't the only point of the battle where ambiguity reigns supreme. As we shall see, the details of nearly every part of the battle are shrouded in some degree of mystery. The time was near 8 o'clock in the morning, and with messages coming in bearing news of Zulu contacts to the north from his pickets and vedettes, Colonel Pelain began to weigh his options. After placing some thought towards the situation, he quickly penned a message for delivery to Chelmsford, who had, of course, departed earlier that morning with the flying column. The time was 8.05. With a force of thousands of Zulus in close proximity, but as yet invisible to those in camp, Pelain ordered the garrison to stand to arms. The bugle sounded, and messengers scurried off to confirm arrangements. The men in camp gathered their equipment and paraded on their respective grounds in front of their unit camps. The pickets were drawn in, save those of the NNC, and a small work party was left out under F Company's Lieutenant Anstey. Thus assembled, Pelain's fighting forces consisted of five companies of his 1st Battalion, less the work party from F Company, what was left of the mounted troops in camp, the two guns of N Battery, G Company of the 2nd Battalion, plus a good number of men who were not required for the flying column, and three companies of the NNC with two more still on picket. The 1st Battalion companies were soon ordered to join with G Company over at the 2nd Battalion camp, that location being more central. These sightings occurred over the course of the few hours after dawn, and the men of the camp's garrison remained formed up in front of the camp, with the two NNC companies remaining in their picket positions. When Chelmsford mobilized the flying column earlier that morning, he had sent a message back to the commander of Number 2 Column, Colonel Durnford, at Works Drift. This contained instructions for him to bring his column, save those parts that had been already committed elsewhere, up to Islandwana. There were, however, no further instructions as to what was expected on their arrival. The message had been carried by an acting transport officer, Lieutenant Smith Dorian of the 95th, he experienced some trouble finding Durnford, as he was out and about, looking for wagons to augment his meagre transport arrangements. Once he had been found and the message passed, Durnford moved as soon as he was ready, with the Natal native mountain contingent and its five troops of some 300 men, a rocket battery with three nine-pounder rocket troughs, and two companies of the 1st Battalion of the 1st NNC. The remainder of the column was engaged in operations elsewhere and did not participate in the forthcoming battle. At the rear was the column transport. The mounted men carried the distance to Islandwana much quicker than the mule-borne rocket battery or the two companies of NNC that were escorting it, not to mention the wagons much further behind. 
en route at the head of his column, which had become somewhat straggling due to his desire to get forward and the difference in speed possessed by his mounted, dismounted, and wagon-borne troops and baggage, he had run into John Chard, who himself was on his way back to Rourke's Drift, after the appearance of the Zulus on the Taolini Spur had caused him to consider the safety of his return to Rourke's Drift. Chard gave an update to Durnford, based on the most current information he had available. With the threat of Zulu movement along the route now established, Durnford rejigged his movement plan in order to give better protection to his baggage, and then pressed on at best speed. Durnford instructed Chard to pass a message to some of the rear elements of his column. One of his NNC companies would stay behind and let the wagons catch up, thereafter escorting them to the camp. It was with his five troops of mounted infantry that Durnford arrived at Islandwana sometime shortly after 10 a.m. Once Durnford and his men arrived, there was an immediate meeting with Colonel Pauline to garner the latest information. By this point, the Zulus had had their so-called false start, and elements of the army, presumably the right horn, had exposed themselves to view to the vedettes and even to the camp itself. Now it must be remembered that the men had been standing too all this time. The decision was made to allow them to relax, as long as their equipment was left on and they were ready for instant action. At some point, either just before or just after Durnford's arrival, and to the response of the Zulu maneuver on the Tahalini Spur, the decision was made to reinforce the high ground to the north with a company of the 24th. Lieutenant Cave's E Company of the 1st Battalion was tasked to occupy the ground to the left of the NNC position on Mkwenny Hill. Once there, Cave detached a section to occupy the ground to his left, to provide for early warning and flank protection. This represented the first commitment of troops from the camp in response to a direct threat. And perhaps a slight pause to discuss what this and subsequent deployments look like. As discussed in part two of the series, British infantry of the late 1870s had adopted a much more general use of extended order tactics. Typically, what may come to mind are stories of resolute Tommies standing shoulder to shoulder in two ranks, firing volleys at their enemy. Although this was by no means non-existent in the drill books and practices of the era, it was not the default way to fight. The much more common practice was the aforementioned extended order. This saw the files of a given body of men, typically a company, spread out and separate from their neighbors by a given number of paces. This number was governed by the task at hand. Two common uses of extended order were for the attack and in order to skirmish. Now the differences between the two were somewhat nuanced. As it pertains to the deployment of E Company, we shall examine the role of skirmishing. This saw a given body of troops deploy to screen the main force, provide for early warning, or engage in preliminary combat before the main body of the enemy made its weight felt. This is the context of E Company's move to the Tahalini Spur. Given the obstacle of the Inyoni Ridge and the dead ground behind it, Pauline made the very natural choice to deploy some of his combat power up on the high ground to observe beyond and, if necessary, make an initial engagement of the enemy. As that enemy had been observed to the north, that is where Pauline deployed his skirmishers. As noted previously, men deployed in extended order would generally do so in three bodies, the firing line, the supports, and the main body or reserve. In this context, the main body must be taken as being those still at the camp, while the presence of supports locally would have been the preserve of the company itself, they being drawn from its own ranks. What the deployment of E Company looked like will never completely be known. We of course are aware of the detachment of a section to the high ground to the east, but as for supports, perhaps one of the remaining three sections was held back with two in the firing line. Alternately, all three were forward, covering the considerable amount of ground assigned to it. By this point, the rocket battery and its escort of now one company of the NNC had arrived at camp. And shortly thereafter, Durnford's second NNC company arrived, but curiously, without the wagons. Surprised, Durnford ordered number three troop under Lieutenant Vaz, as well as the NNC company, to retrace their steps 
find the wagons, and see them safely into the camp. Thus, on the cusp of battle, the camp was left with the following garrison. Five companies of the 1st Battalion, 24th. One company of the 2nd Battalion. With the arrival of number 2 column, there were now five companies from the 1st and 3rd NNC. There were four troops from the Natal Native Mounted Contingent. For support, there were the two guns from N Battery and the three rocket launchers of the Rocket Battery. Of course, there were the remnants of the Imperial Mounted Infantry, the Volunteers, and the Pioneers, as mentioned previously. Now, the discussions between Polain and Durnford have been talked about at great length. Who was in command? Who ordered what? But suffice it to say, Durnford decided to bolster the reconnaissance capabilities on the left flank of the camp. This appears to be partially driven by the fact that there was a report received from sentries atop Islandwana proper that the Zulus were retiring everywhere. He tasked two of his troops, under Lieutenant Roberts and Ra. They would push northeast in an effort to locate and get a better picture of the Zulu forces. They would take with them the NNC company, posted on Mkwenny Hill in close support. These troops were very quickly underway. Sometime shortly thereafter, a report from the Mkwenny Hill was received that indicated that the Zulus that had been maneuvering north of the Nioni Ridge were apparently withdrawing. This placed Dornford in a frame of mind that would see him attack the Zulus rather than help defend the camp. Dornford decided that he would move to the east past Itutsi to scout for and engage the Zulus. Dernford asked Pauline for two companies of the 24th to accompany him on his self-assigned task. There appears to have been some awkwardness as to this decision, but ultimately Dernford would rely on his own units. On his more southerly route, Dernford would take with him the two remaining troops of the Natal Native Mounted Contingent and the Rocket Battery, who would be escorted by his remaining NNC company. In retrospect, it seems perhaps foolhardy that four 50-man troops of native mounted infantry would successfully engage the Zulus in the strength that we now know them to have had. But at this moment, their known numbers, although large, were not overwhelming, and misconceptions of their fighting qualities must have played a role in this decision-making. So, in the space of an hour, Durnford arrived in camp with his command, split that command, and then pushed to the northeast and the east, in a somewhat confusing task of finding and or fighting the Zulu. Durnford had left camp in the direction of the Mangeni. He took a route to the south of Amatutshane and progressed further east, rounding the shoulder of Atutsi. From there, he progressed into a wide, bowl-shaped basin cut by a series of dongas. His progress with the two troops of the Natal native mounted contingent was brisk and purposeful. This, however, caused a large separation between he and his follow-on elements, the rocket battery and its NNC escort, who were moving on foot. By the time Durnford passed Atutsi, they were out of contact with each other. It would seem that Lieutenant Scott of the Natal Carboneers had, after the initial sightings in the early morning, consolidated the vedettes, and there is some evidence that points to reinforcement of them by the volunteers left in camp. Departing slightly earlier than Durnford, the two Natal Native Mountain Contingent troops under Roberts and Raw had climbed up the escarpment and extended, sweeping the plain to the north. They had come across small herds of cattle and their Zulu tenders. Upon contact, these Zulu elements withdrew steadily towards the Ingwabeni. There appears to have been scant evidence at this time of the considerable number of Zulus that had been maneuvering earlier in the morning. As they closed in on their quarries, they advanced up a low ridge, behind which the Zulu cattlemen disappeared. The scene was now set for one of the most dramatic moments in military history. The popular version of events has it that the men of Raj's troop, pursuing the few Zulus to their front, crested the ridge. Before them lay the Ingwabeni Valley, and the very bivouac of the main Zulu army. Hurriedly taking stock of the situation and in full view of many thousands of Zulus, they were immediately advanced upon by the closest Zulu regiments. After firing a volley, they quickly remounted and began what would be a very long and contested withdrawal. This minor contact galvanized the Zulu army, as in the compromise of its main body, it was forced to move immediately to the attack. <laughs> 
So began a hurried but calculated battle plan. The Zulu regiments streamed out of the valley to the southwest following the mounted men of Ra's troop and to the west following the stream. There is another theory that states that Ra's men actually ran into the Zulu army as it was deploying from the valley. The obvious difference with this theory is that the Zulus were already in motion before Ra's men crested the summit. The follow-on question to this, of course, is why, after all the earlier movement and contact with the British, did it take so long to launch the full attack? Very shortly after this initial contact, the men of Robert's troop of the Natal Native Mountain Contingent made contact slightly further north. Faced with what must have seemed like an innumerable host of Zulus maneuvering aggressively towards them, there was no option but to withdraw. This significant and highly dramatic encounter would signify generally the high watermark of British operations within the camp environs. The Zulus were on the move and maneuvering aggressively to attack. There would be no more moving forward from here. The massive Zulu host would not permit it. As it was the men of the Natal Native Mountain Contingent riding their ponies that came into general action first against the Zulus, perhaps at this time it might be appropriate to discuss some of the general principles that surround the use of mounted infantry. Generally used for reconnaissance and screening, mounted infantry's chief strength was in its mobility. The advantage held in this quality was somewhat offset by what could be an inherent deficiency in firepower. Dismounted action, in the face of the enemy, required someone to hold the horses while others were fighting. Typically, the ratio was one in four. As the men dismounted, the reins were given to the horse holders who controlled the mounts in the rear. Thus, only three quarters of any given unit would be involved in actual fighting. Now, mounted action did also occur, but shooting from the saddle from a moving or shifting horse would lessen any advantage gained by having all men firing. George Shepstone, who had accompanied Ra and his men, took it upon himself to deliver news of this most significant contact to Pauline. When he arrived in camp, orders from Chelmsford had also arrived. These were the instructions to break camp and join the flying column at the Mengeni. There was a bit of confusion, as with what was now a not insignificant amount of firing coming from behind the Neone Ridge, Pauline's attention clearly was being drawn in two separate directions. On one hand, instructions from his commander, and on the other, the reality of contact with the enemy so close to camp. Shepstone apparently intervened with some remarks emphasizing the size of the enemy, and it became apparent that any possibility of moving the camp presently was out of the question. In light of this development, the camp was ordered to stand to yet again. The two troops of the Natal Native Mountain Contingent, under Roberts and Raw, plus the supporting company of the NNC, began to retire. At some point, quite early on in the withdrawal, the NNC company routed and left only some of their NCOs and officers who were armed to stand with those of Roberts and Raw. As the Zulu army gradually exited the Nguabini and poured out across the plain behind the Neone Ridge, the three axes of advance began to materialize. Those to the north, who would form the right of the chest and the right wing, moved parallel to the ridge and did not yet begin to converge on the camp. Those of the center began to move towards the Notch and Mkwenny Hill. The left flank of the army moved in a more southerly direction. It would seem that with this semi-simultaneous movement, two contacts would occur far out to the east of the camp. Durnford had, by this time, extended his probe well past Itutsi, while the rocket battery had just rounded Amatutshin. Men of the vedette line from the Natal Carboneers had been in a vantage point such that it would appear as though they had seen a large part of the Zulu army, quote, sitting down, as they put it. They had, in due course, withdrawn to make a report. Sometime shortly after, musketry was heard to the north, and, after a short advance, had met a sizable portion of the Zulu army and were forced to withdraw back towards the Inyoni Ridge. 
perhaps spying the plotting rocket battery down below. They then sent riders to request that Captain Russell and his command come up and engage the enemy. This they did, but before they could gain the high ground, there above them appeared the advance guard of what was probably the Ingobamakosi Regiment. They had only seconds and were able to come into action and fire only one rocket before a Zulu volley hit Captain Russell and killed another man. The mules bolted and the escorting NNC company, too, fled after some desultory firing. The remainder of the battery, now in complete disarray, suffered further with the death of Russell and were trying to organize and fight off the Zulus, who did not initially follow up their attack. It was at this time that Durnford and his men came back around the foot of Itutsi. Previously, Durnford had been quite advanced past this feature. When some men from the Vedettes had delivered a message indicating that the Zulus were advancing on the camp and that he was in danger of being cut off, he made a somewhat flippant remark about cutting his way through them and ordered the riders to return to Lieutenant Scott and instruct him to support further forward movement of his own men. There seems to have been a slight pause while Durnford reacted to the reality of the Vedette's orders, which were in disagreement with his wishes. And while this was going on, his hand was forced. Just then, the advance guard of what may have been the Uve Regiment began appearing on the crest of a ridge above him. Durnford deployed his two troops and waited for the Zulus to get to within about 400 yards before opening fire. As the Zulus flooded over the crest and developed their advance, Durnford began his fighting withdrawal. They retired back towards the southern slopes of Itutsi, and by the time they had rounded its slopes, they could see the few remaining men of the overrun rocket battery making their stand. They were able to link up with some of them, and they withdrew steadily towards the southern face of Amatuchin. From the camp, the Zulus were not yet visible, though musketry from Ra and Roberts could be heard. What could be seen were elements of their NNC escort, who were withdrawing, tumbling back around the Mkwene Hill. On the right flank of the Zulu advance, those who had just left the Ingobini Valley were joined with others who had withdrawn to the north earlier in the morning, and moved across the plain north of the Mkwene Hill and the Spur. As these Zulu forces moved across the ground to the front of E Company on the spur at a range of about 800 yards, Captain Cave ordered his men to open fire. Volleys echoed back into the camp as the first British regulars to engage the Zulus that day began their work. It would seem that the threat was coming from the north then, and Pullain ordered a reinforcement of his skirmish line with another company of the 24th. F Company, under Captain Mostyn. They deployed into the gap, between the main body of E Company already in position and the detached section on the left flank. The forces on the spur were flanked by the NNC Company on Nkwene Hill that had taken the place of that which had moved and supported the advance of Roberts and Raw, and was joined by another on the left flank. To further guard against what seemingly was a larger threat developing from the north, Pullane deployed the two guns of N Battery forward out on a low rise, which overlooked the low ground at the foot of the Inyoni Ridge. Either simultaneously or just after, A Company of the 1st Battalion was ordered forward to protect them. They came into action facing in a general northeastern direction, guarding against a development of any Zulu attack from along the center and eastern parts of the Inyoni Ridge. They didn't have to wait long. The Zulus had, by this point, begun to appear near the notch and elsewhere along the ridge and it would seem that this was around the same time as Russell and the rocket battery had deployed and come to their ignominious end. Major Smith, commanding the guns, opened fire at some 3,500 yards with shrapnel against the targets he could see on the high ground. Apparently, his first ranging shots exploded very close to the NNC troops, who were still deployed in their picket positions from earlier in the morning. So, to perhaps recap the various positions and whereabouts of both British and Zulu forces, we can use this clip. Out in front of the camp, but facing the Inyoni Ridge, there were the two guns of N Battery, with A Company of the 1st Battalion in close support. From the camp, there had been a deployment of two companies, E and F, in addition to two companies of the NNC, to the Tahalini Spur and the Imkwini Hill. 
there were Zulu forces by this time moving across their front from right to left. Down below the escarpment, the NNC picket line was still in position. Zulu forces were now showing themselves on the Inyoni Ridge and were beginning to advance down the notch. The remnants of the rocket battery and Durnford's command were withdrawing in contact from the Zulu left horn, which was swinging around Itutsi. The mounted contingent men of Ra and Roberts had been fighting their way back across the plain north of the Neone Ridge towards the Inkwenny Hill. It would appear that they had broken contact to a degree, allowing the Zulus to dominate the Inkwenny Hill, and they had moved to the bottom of the escarpment to reorganize. Just before this, the last reinforcements had arrived in camp. Having been sent back to fetch the wagons of Number 2 Column, Lieutenant Vaz and his troop came over the saddle with the wagons and the NNC company in tow. They were immediately sent into the fray. Shepstone ordered Vaz to dismount his men and join those of Ra and Roberts. A counterattack was organized, and the NNMC men moved up the hill, driving the Zulu advanced guard off of the heights. It was only a temporary measure, as Zulu numbers were growing. It did, however, buy time for Pauline to organize his defense properly. It was apparent by this time that the camp was under a considerable threat. Zulus were maneuvering in great numbers above the escarpment and showing themselves on the Nyoni Ridge and around Mkwenny Hill. Although not visible from camp, they had forced Durnford back and had destroyed the rocket battery. As already noted, E and F companies were in action on the Tahalini Spur, and the guns of N battery had engaged the Zulus at long range. It was time to consolidate the defense of the camp. In the next chapter of the Islam Duana story, here on the channel, we'll examine the main defensive battle, the collapse of the position, and the flight of the fugitives as they ran for their lives before the victorious Zulu army. I must make mention of my friends in the Die Hard Company. They made my trip and resultingly this series of videos possible. For more information about them, their friends, the Queens, and the group that they came together to form, A Company, 24th Foot, follow the links below. For more videos and podcasts on the Zulu War and other British military campaigns, visit Chris at the Red Coat History Channel. And of course, I'm indebted to those who have authored the references used for this video. Ian Knight's two volumes, Zulu Rising, and his Big Silver book, as well as Colonel Mike Snook's How Can Man Die Better? If you'd like to support the channel, please stop by our Patreon page. The link is in the description below. And for more information on projects and updates between videos, follow us on our Facebook page. The Zulus were on the move and maneuvering aggressively to the attack.